anyway, and then I became a tour manager. I was like, you know, I did all the NERD shit, all the clone shows, all the um, the Pharrell solo album tours until we started Billionaire Boys Club. Killer Killer Podcast. Killer Killer Official dot com. THTC, the UK's leading ethical streetwear label. Organically grown and ethically built garments from hemp, organic cotton and other sustainable materials. 2019 is their 20th anniversary year. Join me with THTC as a Killer Keller podcast sponsor celebrating music, social activism, hemp and street culture. THTC, eco-fashion redefined since 1999. 101.4 FM, 24 hours a day, all genres. Next FM. Beatbox created. Killer Keller. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller podcast. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller podcast striking again with a vengeance. Big shout out to Graffiti Kings and to wherever you are on this beautiful morning. And without further to do, I have on the line from New York, New York, a long standing friend of mine that. Uh, helped to change the shape of my career and many other people's as well. Um, I mean, he's got a life of many lives. And uh, yes, if you, if you want to talk about one of the real ones, he is most certainly it. Um, anyone you ever come across, they either have a story of him or say something extremely welcoming and positive. So I will intro with a warm welcome to my guy, Philip Leeds. How are you, brother? <laughs> I'm good, man. How are you? I'm good, brother. I'm good. It's a pleasure to have you on board, man. Well, I'm happy to be here. How's it been? Uh, it's going. It's going. Uh, well, where going. are you now? You're in New York at the moment? Yep. Upper West Side. Upper West Side. Um, it's where I grew up. I live about 10 blocks from where I grew up. Oh, shit. So you were... So, okay, okay. So um, the last time we heard, I heard was that you were going... You were off to New Hampshire to stay away from people f- during quarantine for a piece. Uh, actually, New Jersey, another one of the new states out here. Um, yeah, I went down to the Jersey Shore, a um, little, little beach hideaway, um, and got out of the city for a couple of weeks when it first kicked off here. Um, but I've been back at least, I don't know, two or three weeks. Um, Nobody even knows what day it is, but um, I think I spent about three weeks out of the city and the rest of the time in the city. Right. So for those of you that, that it, and it's fair to say that I would put down maybe 40 percent of my audience will know who you are from one mini life of yours to another. But my intro to you, Billionaires Boys Club, Pharrell, NERD touring. I mean, yeah, I, I think I think it's safe to say I, I, I came in <laughs> You know, when, when, when it was peak and you were on your height, height of traveling, doing your thing. But then in getting to know you, I realized like how deep into like touring you were, bands you were associated with, the graffiti and hip hop scene, New York itself. Do you know what I mean? Like you've got like, like I said, you, you, you are, um, you're, you're very much the, um, buck stops to a lot of people and crossroads in which people know you i know people who know you and it's mad how connected and in the mix you are bro it's it's weird sometimes i don't even know who i know um (laughs) you know i think that that it's like there's it's, it's not unique to me but it's it's maybe unique to like people from a certain time and place you know, I grew up in, in New York City. Um, I was a teenager in the 80s. I met a lot of people then. New York was a wild place. And, you you know, as a young person, you could go out and do adult things. Mm. Um, in addition, my dad was in the music industry. And so I grew up, you know, with a backstage pass. So what yeah. was so hold on so your dad was in the music what was he what was his role in the the grand scheme Well my dad who's also from the upper west side um I'm a fourth generation upper west side kid um was into like 
he, you know, he was a teenager and a young man in like the early, in the fifties and the early sixties and got into like the twist scene in New York and the peppermint lounge and managed Sick. high school bands. Um, managed a band called every mother's son managed a band called the wind in the willows, which was the first band that, or one of the early bands that Deborah Harry was in from Blondie. Right. And then in the seventies, my dad, um, not through the wind in the willows, but through somebody else ended up managing Blondie. And so my dad managed Blondie, I think sort of after their first album was recorded or around then. Right. Um, and got them off of private stock records, got them their deal with Chrysalis Records and took them to, you know, I guess through Auto American, which was the fourth or fifth album. Um, and he also, during that time, his company managed The Runaways, which was Joan Jett and Lita Ford. I, I don't... I'm already thinking... I'm, I, I, it's too... This is already too much for me, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... It's going to be one of them podcasts, I know it. Carry on. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, I grew up, like... My first concert, I was six, and I went and saw Iggy Pop with David Bowie playing keyboard, I think. Or David Bowie performed with Iggy Pop that night. I was six. I don't really remember too much of it. But Blondie opened for them. And so I saw Blondie in 76 at the Palladium in New York when it was a concert hall. Oh, my God. Um, And then, like, me and my brother would be like, you know, we want to go to Kiss. And my dad would get us tickets to go see Kiss. And we'd be back. Like, yo. Keys to the city, bro. In seven, I think in 79, my brother and I went and saw, well, you know, with my mom and dad, I was probably nine or 10. Right. Saw Kiss. And my dad's friend, Shelly Finkel and Jimmy Coplick were the promoters for the show. We were backstage chilling. Stop. And we encountered, we met Gene and Paul, Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley without their fucking makeup on. No. Which was unheard of. Yeah, yeah, she's just like, whoa. And, yo, our friends, when we got back to school on Monday, our friends didn't believe us that we met them without their makeup. But anyway, Man. so then, you know, as a teenager in New York City in the 80s, I, you know, met a lot of people who I still know and who went on to do great things. And, ex, you know, just experienced New York at that time, which was, you know, formidable. Huh. Well, I don't know if that's the right word. It, 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 last, it, it helped form me, what I'm trying yeah. to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, I, you know, I was like a, a juvenile delinquent, you know, writing graffiti, doing drugs, you know. Just what did you used to write, Phil? What was your tag? Shop, S-H-O-K. <laughs> um, there's other shocks. I'm not the famous shock from England, the dope shock from England who does the, the X-ray shit. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah he's killing yeah. But another shock. Um, and there's a there's a shock here in New York too. Um but anyway, um my crew's BFB, MDC, TMF, TPT. Um, you know, one of the things I'll just say this is about like a lot of different stuff. It's like I'm interested in it and I dabble in it and I get down with shit, but it's like it's not like I wouldn't say I'm a graffiti writer. Or I'm a whatever. You know, it's like I wrote graffiti, but I didn't like excel at it or anything. I like to bomb and write and shit and fuck shit up and Yeah. Whatever. Um I always I always get that impression about you actually, to be fair. Um I and I think it's because of the people that I've met through you or that know of you. They there are so there's quite broad walks of life and a lot of generational differences as well. Like some younger guys and some older guys and some, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, yeah. I feel like you. I feel like you. You are more of a, a social butterfly. You, you well, kind of. Do you know what I'm saying? It, isn't that exemplified in my book? You got a book? Yeah, I got a book. Have you got it with you? Can you see it? I need to see the book. He's got a book, man. Um. 
Yeah, this I got is the beauty book. about doing podcasts in people's houses. They get how do you know I ain't got? I don't even know about this. I, I, first of all, how come you're not in it, dude? I had no idea you had a book. This is a sealed copy. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna open it. No, no, no! Don't, but, don't. But I have an open copy here. What the, this is a book. Um, this is crazy. I'm looking down here. I'm looking down here, by the way, because that's where the screen is, so I can see it. Um, hold on. Let me find a good page to show you. This is uh, crazy. When did so, you do this? So this kind of speaks to what we were just talking about, about like, you know, I'm not, a, this, this is hard to say because it's true and it's not true. I'll, and I, but I say this truthfully, I don't consider myself a photographer. Right. But I have a book of portraits. Here, you know these guys. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, the boys. Yeah. Um, I have a book of portraits. And this was Here, done on an icon? Here's Killer Mike. No, these are all Polaroids. Right. Killer Mike and Max Glazer. So. Mad. There's a lot of people in this book that you know, Keller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I got into the, you know, my dad's Nikon and 35 millimeter photography in high school. Right. And then I think kind of through my mom, my mom likes antiques and thrift stores and whatever. Uh-huh. I got into vintage Polaroids. Are they hard to get the vintage ones? Well, now it's hard to get film. I was going to say, cause I've got a couple of mates that were making books and you know, they, you got hustled to get to get those old school Kodaks. Yeah. 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 Um, Sick, Matt. Who's, who's Jada Kiss and Ice Pick? This so, is mad. This is crazy. I keep on saying it. Justin Timberlake and my man Eli. Dude. Eli is one of the founders of Zoo York Skateboarding. He's Andre Leon Talley and Fam Lay. I'm troubled that I don't know about it. <laughs> I am too, a little bit. Yeah, it's bothering me. I, like, thought, I, thought, I thought you'd be prepared for this interview. <laughs> dude, dude, no, no, I mean more personally. I'm like, how come <laughs> in 2016 I did not know that this was fucking right? Well, I mean, I, I'm full of surprises. <laughs> so, anyway, I just I wasn't trying to be a photographer or make a book or anything, right? My point, why, why I brought up the book was the book is the crossroads of Philip. Mm. So there's all kind of people in that book. There's the elevator dude from my office building and my cousin and girls I know and yeah. fucking astronauts and, you know, fashion icons and music icons. And like, yo, it's like really a unique collection of people. Crazy. That could really only come from me or a few other people who move like me. Yeah, you yeah. Know? I'm not saying a few. I mean, there's a lot of people who move a lot wild, more wildly than me. But... You know, this, and, and I wasn't trying to do this. I just had them in a shoebox. And then I got a fucking cheap plastic photo album. And when, pe- like, like those two pictures I showed you of Shay and Lee Harvey, the black and white ones. Those are, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. the oldest ones from that camera. That camera is a specific portrait camera. Um, oh, and I started God. shooting that camera in 2004. And, you know, I was touring with, with the guys and... Um, and those pictures, those, that, those are pictures that are at my house in Brooklyn. They were there. And I just, that camera is like kind of big and weird and bulky. So I never, I never yeah. traveled with it. No, that's right. So, like if you came to my house, this is the camera. Oh, dude, so this, yeah, this is, this, this precedes the iPhone clearly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not the one. You don't want to take that on tour. You mean it must be worth a bit of money? No, they're cheap. They're just plastic. Okay, so they just don't handle very well if you take them somewhere. Yeah, they crack if you smash them. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, them. so if you came to my house in Brooklyn, I might take your picture. You Man, can you, look, this this is all too much for me. <laughs> this is just a lot of information in one fog. You should be doing a podcast. Have you ever thought about doing podcasts? That's me. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just, it's just a, you know, hey, you like Kelly. You know what this is? Right here. Hold on. No. Hold on. No, you hold on. Yeah, yeah. 
Is that in is that in uh, Billionaire's Boys Club? Yeah, it's the showroom. It's in the showroom, right? Yeah. yeah, I went there a couple of times. That was like one of my favorite spots in New York. Whenever I was there, I was like, let's go see Phil. <laughs> so, you know, at first I just had that camera at the house. And then after I stopped touring, I kept it at the office when I worked for the clothing company. Yeah. And if you came to the office and I thought about it, I might take your picture. And and actually, Snoop is the first person who was like, damn, Phil, you got a lot of pictures. He's like, why don't you make a book? And I was like, I don't know, Snoop. Why don't I make a book? You could be, I was like, you could be my book agent. Like, to me... Even though the pictures were interesting, I, I, I generally, genuinely love the pictures and they're dope. And like a lot, it's like, it's kind of like, it's a dope book because everybody knows the different 30 people in the book. Exactly. You know what I mean? And so, yeah. but still, I didn't think that anybody, you know, I was just like, I'm not a photographer. It's like, my friends are photographers. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, mm. who wants, even though the pictures are dope, who's going to buy a, a book? Who's going to buy my book? Um, Did that cross your mind when you were making it? I actively tried not to make it. So, so just going about my business, I, I'm, I'm working at Billionaire Boys Club. We hire Mark McNary to design some shit for us. He's a designer, American designer. Mm-hmm. So Mark McNary is going around while working for us, trying to, sh- he has a book idea and he's trying to shop a book idea. He has a meeting with a guy at Rizzoli named Ian Luna. Ian, whatever, hears Mark out and says, no, I'm more, I, I need to do more like art and photo books. Mark says to him, oh, you should, and Mark and I sit next to each other and Mark's seen my photos, the, the, the shoe box that sits on my desk. Mark's like, oh, you should do a book with Philip. He's got great photos. And I'm sure Ian was like, who the fuck is Philip? And then Mark introduced us via email and was like, you should show Ian your book, your photos. And I replied to the email, like, nice to meet you. Thanks. Like, yeah, let's talk next week or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I never followed up. And I just, it made me uncomfortable. It made me like, I'm not going to make a book. Nobody Nobody wants my book. Then, through no fault of Mark McNary or Philip, Ian Luna goes on to be Pharrell's editor for his Rizzoli books, his Places and Spaces and the other Yeah, books. yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and then I go to Pharrell's wedding, and who am I sitting next to at the reception? Ian Luna. So this thing is like totally fighting you out. It, <laughs> yo, it's like, I can't get rid of it. So <laughs> I go, I'm like, hey, I'm Philip. He's like, oh, you're Philip with the Polaroids? And I was like, oh, yes. God damn it. Yeah. Philip with the Polaroids. Um, and he's like, you should come and show them to me when we get back to New York or whatever. So I was like, okay, I will. I'm still acting super weird. And in my mind, I don't want Ian to only want to do the book because I got celebrities. Mm-hmm. Like, I want him to do it because they're good pictures. That's your moral That's your moral thing clicking in your head. It, it's, I mean, I shouldn't have given a shit, I don't think, at the end of the day. But whatever. It was like, that was, that was something to me. Maybe. I like the viceness of it. I like the, I like the feeling of it. It looks, looks like, it looks like the kind of thing that is only ever done once. And it looks, yeah, like I say, vicey. You know what I mean? Well, I'll tell you something. They're, they're mug shots, basically, is why they look so... They're just like super bright flash. You can't hide any fucking flaws. It's like, it's a mug yeah. shot. Yeah. Um, so when I went to see him, I only took a couple pictures of... I, the only celebrity I took was Pharrell. And everybody else was somebody who basically he wouldn't know. But yeah. interesting photos. I chose okay. interesting people that weren't famous. And... The results of the meeting were basically like, yeah, they're cool. The book would do better if you had more celebrities, but I'm down. Let's do it. I can't really give you any money, but I'm down to make the book. And, you know, again, I wasn't trying to like earn my living being a photographer. So I was like, yeah, I'm down to make a book, whatever. It's an honor to have a book with Rizzoli. It's the the top of the pyramid of art and cultural books. You know, Rizzoli is like one of Insane, yeah. It's one of few. So I was like, oh, okay, you want, us, you want more celebrities? And the next time I showed up, I brought like wild celebrities. And he was like, oh my God, now we got a book. And at the time he had just done um, K-1000. 
Kim Kardashian selfie book, which was a big seller for Rizzoli. And so my thing was I want to do the photos as close to the actual size of the photos. That's sick, yeah. And his thing was like, well, we just did this small little Kim Kardashian book. Let's do it the same size. Great. So it's the same size as Kim Kardashian's book. She has more more pages. Um, and then, you know, I spent about, whatever, eight months or something scanning the photos and laying it out and whatever. Uh. Went on a little Asia tour to celebrate the release of the book. Did some things in Hong Kong and Bangkok and Singapore and Tokyo. Uh. Dude. Had events in all those places. Yeah. Like, yo, it, you know, it made me uncomfortable in the beginning to, like, I mean, it still does a little bit to say I'm a photographer and now I'm an author. Yeah, yeah, you're an author now. Yeah, you, you know. <laughs> um, it's really life changing, though. It's like, it's like, yeah. it, it feels like an accomplishment and, like, you know, it really affected my life positively in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and it's really, you know, I was just doing it for fun. It was like a hobby of mine. And it turned out to like one of kind of like a lifetime achievement. For sure. And, and you know, in this day and age, when I think about, you know, an, a, a, bio, a biographical novel or a book or you're writing or doing something, you forget that, you know, there's different mediums in which a, a book of your life can be interpreted. And the f- photography one is a great one, especially, for, like I said, for you, because, you you know, you, you magpie scenes, you meet people and... Uh, you're extremely memorable, you know what I mean? And I think there's a lot to be said about that, uh, an imagery book or an audio book or a podcast. I think that works for you, bro. Like, I do. Like, I can imagine you with your own podcast. You know, all these people you a know. Of, a lot of people have been trying to get me to do that. Yeah. Um, I've been trying to think of some some things to, um, to do with my time now that I'm under quarantine. Mm. Um, along those lines, but I haven't really kind of landed on one yet. Um, real quick, just to, just to finish the, the pedigree conversation. Mm, 100%. Um, you know, okay. So I grew up in New York, my dad, cause it was the eighties, you know, and like, it was like Reagan era. My dad was on some real, like, even though he smoked weed was on some real, like, you know, hard ass parenting shit. And we were, we had a lot of conflict because I was such a delinquent. And he basically made me leave New York for college. When high school was over, he was like, I wanted to go, I wanted to stay in New York and get in the music industry. I I didn't didn't not want to go to college, but I didn't want to leave New York. He was like, you're too wild for the night. You're too plugged in in New York. You know everybody, you move around too easy. It's too easy for you to wild out. You got to go. So... I left. I, I got. I only got into a couple colleges, but the only college that was on like an East Coast city was Northeastern in Boston. So I went to Boston for a year. Right. Terrible idea. Um, as a New York kid with the freedoms of New York City, to go to Boston, which is like a historical college town where they're not having any kind of underage debauchery at all. They had graph writers there, though. They had graph oh, yeah. writers. Bro, me and my man, my man KR, you know the ink brand the markers, Crink? Yeah, of course, yeah. Okay, my man started, my man, that's my man's company. He writes KR. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. He's like my, we went to high school together. We've been friends forever. So he and I, he, he went to art school in Boston at the same time I got into Northeastern. So he and I went to Boston and just on some dumb, young New York kid shit, just we went over everybody and we didn't care and we were on some like we're from new york fuck you you know on some yankee red sox rivalry on some you know just yeah yeah, new yeah york and boston people don't get along yeah yeah, and yeah yeah we went up there and like you know definitely disrespected some people um but that got our names out and you know that's how we actually met a bunch of kids that we ended up being cool with um like rise um and wombat and zone and sick. Like there. sick sick when i first started writing it was like when trains were being done mm. really cracking down the train they had like a clean car program and 
like trains were still bombed, but it was it was at the end of the train era when I started. Mm. Um, but anyway, we we kind of hated Boston, being from New York and being young and alcoholics and whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it was hard for us to live the life that we were accustomed to. So we, sure. after that first year in Boston, we ended up both moving to to California. And Craig moved to San Francisco and I moved to, I was going to move to Santa Cruz. So I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Huh. But when I got to Santa Cruz, I was like, oh, this is not it. And just, I had kind of flown through San Francisco and stayed with Craig and then went down to Santa Cruz. Wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And I went back to Frisco and just executed my California plan in San Francisco. Right. Um, which is where I got down with TMF and um, some other dope writers out there. Magic, Dream, yeah. Dream and Spy, TDK. Um, but, you know, it's like, you know, I was into a bunch of different stuff. So like, you know, like Craig and, and you know, Twist and and the TMF guys were like a little bit more dedicated to, to graffiti. I was into girls and smoking weed and, mm-hmm. you know, parties and DJing and, um, and whatever. So I, mm-hmm. I wasn't like, as focused as some other other people were. Um, and then when I graduated, like my dad basically was like, I'm not going to help you get into the music industry until you graduate college. I was like the last hope for a Leeds boy to graduate college. And it was important. Right. Um, which in retrospect was a terrible idea. He should have let me alone in <laughs> and get in the industry. Because by the time I took my, my fifth year victory lap of, you know, transferring credits and, you know, getting out of college, he yeah. basically was out of the music industry and wasn't very helpful. Wasn't helpful at all. Right. To tell you the truth. I mean, he was, su- he was supportive, mm. but he didn't have the juice that he, he used to have. And if yeah. he had executed the juice when I was a freshman and put me in some internship or whatever, I could have done that in college and yeah. been in a better place at the end of college. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the Reagan era for you. Yeah. Um, you know, just say no. <laughs> hard ass, hard ass parents doing the same shit in the yeah. other room. But um, it served you right. I mean, you you kept, you you evolved from there, right? You, you went back to New York. Yeah. I, as soon as I got out of school, I moved back to New York. Um, so, San Francisco got small. I love San Francisco. It's one of my favorite cities, and some of my favorite people are there. But it got small for me. You know, you see the same people at the same five clubs, and yeah, the scenes are all very small, and it's like a much tighter, closer community. And I mean, for um, San Francisco, for for Frisco, I, you don't you don't think that. When I think of Frisco, I think of like you know, I don't know, a more you know, bouncing music scene. But I guess that depreciates with every year that goes by. Well, I, guess, I think because, it also it also popped off a little bit after I left. I think it continued to grow, and right. like hyphy music. The Bay Area, the Bay Area music scene definitely grew. Yeah. From like I left, I mean, it was it was it was great. It had a great music scene. I'm not I'm not trying to say it wasn't stimulating. It's just you know the you go to the hip hop show, whatever it is. Yeah, same people all the time. The same seven hundred and fifty people or whatever. Yeah, I get you. Or however size the venue is. Um. Yeah. So I got back to New York. I got a job in a record store, Tower Records. Crazy, and, yeah. Um, and my friend Brian, who was a family friend, had somehow gotten him himself an internship. I don't know how he got it at Rush Producer Management. Right. And his bosses, Derek Jackson and Francesca Spiro, had found a couple groups. This is like 93, 94. And the groups they found was a group called the Boogie Monsters. Of course. And they got the Boogie Monsters, their EMI deal. And Brian... That was a big deal for that kind of rap group rap yeah, back then. Yeah, that was a big deal. Yeah. Um, and Brian politicked himself a job at EMI off the connections he made um, through them doing that deal. This is my dog, Ruff. Hey, Ruff, how are you? Look at his little head going off. Bless him. Look at him. 
Um, uh, he's an old timer. He's fourteen. Oh boy. Um, and the other group they found was the Roots, and Franny yeah. and Derek helped the Roots get their deal at Geffen. Wow. So Brian got a job and called me and said, "Do you want my internship?" I said, yes. He's like, yeah. <laughs> um, Rush Producer Management was one of several offices out of Def Jam. Mm-hmm. So this is the second Def Jam office on Varick Street. The, the original Def Jam, the, the legendary offices were on Elizabeth Street, and that's like the, the beginnings of Def Jam. And, and the stories from, from that office are... I've heard a lot and are legendary. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not to take anything away from Varick Street, because Varick Street was just full of gems. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and Francesca, Francesca came from like radio from BLS and she had worked for, I think she managed Marley Mall. Right. Um, and, um, and, they managed Easy Mo B, and Easy Mo B was making Biggie Small's first record. And I had to do all the admin, A&R admin for, for Biggie's studio sessions, or for, for Easy studio sessions. And she managed Domingo and LG and, and helped with Large Professor and Diamond D and, and Violator. Chris Lighty and Violator was in the office next to, to Franny's. Jesus Christ. It, it was Violator, Francesca, um, a guy named Heavy Metal Scott, Scott Koning, who, right. who was he was a leftover from like the Rick Rubin Slayer side of Def Jam. I was about to come to that, actually. Yeah, my Heavy Metal days. I know you have some. <laughs> I actually ended up working for Heavy Metal Scott, and that was Did sort you? of yeah. I basically so I'll, I'll just cut it a little short because we're, we're we're running we're running long. But I got the internship for Franny. Uh, now I work at fucking Def Jam, but I don't work for Lior and them. Like, so I don't have to like get involved with like all the label drama. I have like, I work for a little management company and it's dope. Right, and right. it's like, you know, it's like, um, Red, Red Man, EPMD, Method Man, DMX, Foxy Brown. And then while I was there is when Fox brought Dame and Jay up there and when Rockefeller started and wow. Murder Inc. So DMX, Murder, Inc., Irv Gotti are all up there. Jay and Dame come up there. And and then Mercury, Polygram, buys half of Def Jam. Right. They come around and they look at all these little companies that Violator and Francesca and JM. Oh, Jam Master J. So it went Heavy Metal Scott, um, Peter Thomas, and How Can I Be Down? Yeah. And... and JMJ, Jam Master J's office. And then so the what, rest did Onyx of- come through? Did Onyx pass through there? Oh, yeah, all the time. Of course, yeah. Fredro and Sticky would knock gold records, like flip desks all the time. No, it was wild. People that know my podcast, right, know when I'm absolutely fucking, f- I am stumped. DMX knocked out Chris Lady. Your yeah. levels, your Pretty- levels of stories are absolutely doing me in. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> we have to have a part two. We are. We fucking uh, are. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> so it was a, a, a wonderful place. I met mad people who, you know, were idols of mine. Like in my first two weeks, I didn't even know anybody. And, you know, I, Francesca, Francesca at the time, Derek was just like a hustler. He was out in the street taking meetings. He was never at the office, he was a producer mm. in the studio. Francesca was sort of over it and didn't really want to hustle anymore. So she got me, this is really interesting. You'll be into the story. Mm -hmm. She got me to come in and I kind of like took over her office operations. I scheduled all the meetings for the, you know, the sessions and the producers and whatever. I sent music out. I did all the fucking paperwork, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then a young guy, I think she probably, I think we probably met Rob through Derek, but Rob Walker there you go. came and started working for Franny and basically had a deal with Francesca. Rob had been an intern at RCA. No way. And the deal that Rob made with Francesca was 
he was going to go and do the legwork for Francesca's producers. And he was going to go and take A&R meetings and shop Franny's Beats for Easy and LG and Domingo and Sid and whoever else. Um, wow. And in exchange, he could shop his producer's beats too. And Rob had met two young producers from Virginia because one of them, by the name of Pharrell Williams, had been incessantly calling Rob's boss, and Rob's boss wasn't talking to him. Wow. Rob and Pharrell ended up talking and forming a friendship, and then Rob ended up managing these two weirdos from Virginia named the Neptunes. That's right. And at the time, Pharrell and Chad were Rob's weird producer friends from Virginia that would come to the office and sit on the couch and go to meetings with Rob. So Franny didn't come to the office very much. Rob took her meetings and I ran the office and Derek was just Derek. The, like, before, even before Rob came there, when I first started working there, I didn't know anybody at Def Jam. Yeah. I, Fran was there for like maybe the first week and then the second week she didn't come to the office at all. It was like, it was like summer in New York, so it was a little slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know anybody at Def Jam and I'm, you know, I'm young I'm the white guy. Yeah. And I'm not uncomfortable, but it's like, I don't know anybody. Like, I'm just yeah. keeping it myself. I'm doing my work. I'm happy to have a fucking internship. Sure. I hear somebody, Fran, oh, Franny's in the office. She's like, okay, I'm leaving. She goes back to her house in Long Island. Like 10 minutes after she leaves, I hear somebody yell my name in the, in the hallway. And I'm like, nah. I thought I heard somebody yell Philip. Mm-hmm. I'm like, nah, nobody even knows me. And then I hear my full name. And I'm like, what? I poke my head out the door and down the hall, I can't really see who it is. It's like pretty far away. Yeah, yeah. Is a a black gentleman wearing a like light yellow kango, light yellow uh, kind of Argyle Fat Farm era sweater vest. Yeah. Like summer fashion. Mm Mm-hmm. Can't remember what color shorts. Maybe white shorts and then yellow and yellow and uh, yellow and white Air Force high tops. Right. And I'm like, I'm Philip, and he's like, Grandmaster Flash. What? 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 I'm like, no. <laughs> you know, come in here. Come here. Come uh, in. He's like, I just saw. I ran into Francesca outside. She said to come up here and play play these beats for you. She said, what? <laughs> Yo, I was like, okay, let's let's listen to some beats. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm bugging. I'm like, you know, I'm 24. I don't know shit. Yeah. And Grandmaster Flash is playing me his beats and like wanting my opinion. Madness. Hoping I like them or something. Like, yo, it was bugged out. Bro, do you do you sit? Do you do you think this through? After the fact, do, do you ever sit there and you're like, how did I get myself into this situation or this situation? Yo, no, it all just happens. I mean, like at the time, you know, that's a legend to me. That's like an idol. Yeah, yeah. And like, I mean, at the time, like that, that same, like that, that first period when I first got the Def Jam, hmm. I, it was like shit like that. And like one of the first days I walked around a corner too fast and bumped into LL Cool J and dropped a bunch of shit and like was like, oh excuse me. <laughs> like looked up, looked up and it was LL Cool J. I was like, oh my God. You know, I had all the classic like, you know, new jack shit. Yeah. And like, you know, just young experience. But you know, you figure it out. Like honestly, like that that was in like August, July, August when I started working there. Yeah. And that that Christmas I, you know, I was still like, whatever, I've been there four months or something. I was still, you know, pretty new. Yeah. Um, at like late in the day on a Friday, Chris Lighty like blessed me with like passes to the, to the Christmas party. And like, yo, he gave me like the all access joints oh, and shit. I had like the best night of my life. It was like a wild ass <laughs> Def Jam party at the Palladium. Crazy. Uh, that, you know, the epic shit, the <laughs> epic. Def Jam moments and you know Dude, like I like, know a person that was at a Def Jam Christmas party at the Palladium 
yeah. that's, that's mad in itself in terms of degrees of separation. I think people, I think everybody that knows you can appreciate where I'm coming from. I both know five other people that were there. Like I talked to my friends about shit from high school. Like I have friends that I met after high school and we were all at the same shit, like, you know, within feet of each other 10 years earlier or whatever, or like across the room or on different sides of the fight or whatever. It's like, it's bugged out how small the world is. We both know bad people that were at that party. So I work for Franny. Polygram buys half of Def Jam. They look at all these little companies like they all got to go. They're not paying any money in. They're just leeches. They got to go. So Franny's the first one out, tries to get me to reverse commute to, to, to work for her. I'm like, no, nah, I'm staying in the city. Mm-hmm. And I step to Peter Thomas and pitch him the idea that I'm going to put together a guidebook for how can I be down and sell ads in it. And we're going to split the money and that's how I'm going to eat. Hmm. That turned into like a whole job and wild situation. How can I be down was absolutely crazy. Um, <laughs> it was like, you know, when Biggie and Wu-Tang and yeah, all of that was just wild for the night. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bro. Uh, and then after, wh- while I was working for Peter, yeah, I used to talk to Heavy Metal Scott all the time because I grew up going to CBGBs and loving New York City hardcore. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So that's like another bucket of where I know people from. And yeah. so, you know, Heavy Metal Scott, he's a New York heavy metal guy. He's been at CBGBs for all the shows I've been to. And so we would, we were like the two metal guys that could, you know, I mean, I, I never really was a metalhead. I was, you know, much more. No, but you could chop it up. You knew. You yeah, knew. but I love Slayer. I love fucking Metallica and like whatever. Yeah. I'm down. And so one day Scott's like, what are you going to do after the conference is over? After how can I be down? And mm-hmm. I was, I jokingly said, I'm going to work. I was thinking I'd come work for you. Yeah. He was like, yo, I was thinking the same thing. I was like, really? Yeah. Yeah, I, was yeah. like, hey. I was like, so I started working for Scott and Scott managed Biohazard. Fear Factory, um, Downset, Earth Crisis. Hold tight, Mad Downset Ball. as well. Big shout, Downset. Yo, all those bands. Madball, love those guys. So, damn. So, is that how Biohazard got to connect with Onyx and they did that uh, tune for? Um, we're all Def Jam. Yeah. Well, yeah, we were all Def Jam. Right. Gotcha. Um, So I started working for Scott. Scott avoided the polygram knife because he had a label deal through Def Jam. So that's, that label became part of polygram or mercury or whatever it was at the time. Right. And Def Jam ended up moving out of Varick Street up into uh, Fifth Avenue or uh, Eighth Avenue, Worldwide mm-hmm. Plaza. So we moved into the Polygram building and um, worked out of there for a long time. And that's sort of how Lior got his corporate shit popping into taking over Polygram and Universal or whatever. But wow. eventually they moved the, the rock department to Los Angeles and Scott ended up moving to LA. Wanted me to move to LA. I was like, I'm not moving to LA. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I will do is I will continue to do my job and I want to tour manage the bands because I wanted to travel. Yeah. Yeah. So I, my first tour was with fear factory in Europe and then fear factory started opening for black Sabbath. And we did like the, the 20 anniversary, in Birmingham fucking shows, we opened for Black Sabbath for the four shows at NEC Center in Birmingham. Sick. Wow. The sickest. The sickest. And OzFest with like Pantera and Slayer and Sepultura and Mad. like, yo, here's a good Mad. story. I got a great story. Go <laughs> Okay, so, oh, and just, just so you know what type of dude I am, when, when push comes to shove, I'm now I work for Heavy Metal Scott. We need to hire somebody 
I hire my man, Brian, who got me my internship at Rush. That's sick. What a way the world turns around. And now it's me, heavy metal Scott, and my man, Brian. Love it. And Brian, like, basically is the point person for half of Scott's bands, and I'm the point person for the other half of Scott's bands. And then eventually Brian got a different job and left, but I went on tour with, I did, I did a summer tour with Downset that was fucking epic. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you my Ozzy story. So <laughs> Brian, so Ozfest Milton Keene, um, this is like probably like 98 maybe. Right. Um, it's in this, it's in the like late spring, early summer. And, and after Ozfest, Fear Factory is going on a European tour. They need a right. guitar tech. So we find a, a potential guitar tech to hire in Europe so we don't have to fly somebody over there. And we tell him to meet us at Milton Keen basically for an interview. Gotcha. So this dude shows up. He's like a very, I'm not going to say stereotypical, but he's like a, a young English metalhead who really wants this job. And he got up early, he brushed his hair, and yeah. he, showed up, he showed up bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Gotcha. So, <laughs> I know, you know this So we get there. It's like, you know, the show, the gate, op- the show starts at noon. We're like, meet us there at 10. We all get there. He gets his passes and comes and meets us. And he's got a real thick, not London accent, but English accent. Like maybe he's up from up north or something. I don't know. I don't gotcha, know. Where. Gotcha. Okay. But but he didn't speak like your. He's not speaking your English. Right. Right. So he, um, you know, he's talking to me and my man Brian, and he asks us if we smoke, and I'm like, yeah, we smoke. And he's like, cool. And he pulls out a piece of hash like the size of this book. And breaks off a giant piece of it, like maybe a third of it, and gives it to me, me and Brian. We're like, cool, thanks. You know, that's great. We need this it's something to smoke. Yeah, yeah. Then we go to the we go to the trailer to meet the band and, and our boss. And we walk in the trailer and it's Fear Factory, and Fear Factory had some wives that would be along. So we right. walk in the trailer and it's like a long, like, you know, trailer. Yeah. The door on the side and in on the far side from the door is like a coffee table, four band members and three wives and our boss standing around the table. And we're like, all right, just, you know, chill here for a minute, let them finish what they're doing. And then we'll introduce you. Yeah. And he's like, he, he like pulls out a sandwich bag with white powder in it. And he's like, y'all do crank. What? And Brian, Brian, this dude has like some, the kid who wants the job has some sort of rock and roll fantasy in his eye, in his head. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. What Brian says to him, "Be cool with that," as in, "No, put that away. You're about to not get the job." Yeah, 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 totally. And in, in lost in the translation, the kid thinks that Brian just said, "That's cool." Oh my god! Fuck. Who without does missing, that? Who does that in the job? Who does that? Without missing a beat, he walks over to the table that they're standing around and dumps some shit out on the table and starts chopping it up. He hasn't even met anybody. Wow. Everybody. In the fantasy life, man. Wow. Everybody is like, you know, eyes bugging out of their head, looking at him and then looking at us. And we're like, I don't know. He yeah. has a bunch of fucking lines and then offers it to everybody standing around him. He's like kneeling down on the floor with seven people he doesn't know. One or two, one or two, one or two. two. Everyone's like, nah, I'm good. I'm not, not. And so nobody takes any. His, his flawed decision is to huff a bunch of fucking lines and then scoop the rest back into the bag and like, yo, my man went from creamy white to fucking beet red instantly. Gets Jesus. up and he's like, oh, and right when this happens, the first band starts playing. It's like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> you 
Yo, my man hops up. He's like, I'm going to go check this out real quick. I'll, when you got to finish, we'll talk, okay? And, and, and bounces. Everyone's like, yo, what the fuck? What and the I fuck? Just, yeah, yeah. I just look at Dino, the guitar player. I was like, yo, that's your new guitar tech. <laughs> he's like, fuck, no, it's not. I was like, yeah, that's your guitar tech, bro. Oh Needless to say, oh, God. yo, he comes back. In about 20 minutes, right? He showed up. He was wearing his best flannel shirt, had his hair blown out and brushed. Yeah. Was pretty, like, look. Had it together. Came back without the flannel shirt with, like, a footprint, a muddy footprint on his chest, hair disheveled, beat red and sweating. And, yo, my man Brian just goes and peels the sticky pass off that we gave him. And it's like, yo, have a good day, man. You got to go. What a fucking failure. Okay. What an absolute lost cause. Amazing. So now me and Brian have all this hash. Now we're the hash guys. So we're hanging out with all the bands. We're like giving people hash. We're all smoking hash. It's having a great time. So now Pantera's on. Fucking great. My favorite. Yeah. Pantera, man. Boss, Come on. My boss is dating a woman who works for their management. So we, and, and you know, we've been playing shows with them. So, you know, we're, we're all family. Yeah, yeah. So me and my boss and his girl are standing behind Vinnie Paul, the drummer, just enjoying Pantera with like 60,000 people, right? Crazy. Crazy. You know, it's fucking crazy. Yeah. So here comes Tom from Slayer walking up to us. Nah. Heavy Metal Scott, my boss, he knows everybody, right? Yeah. So Tom walks up on the other side and says something to Scott. Scott looks over and points at me. Tom walks over. And he's like, hey, man, you got a pipe or something? I got this hash. Because now everybody has hash. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I got hash too. So now me and Tom from Slayer are standing behind Vinnie Paul smoking hash. Insane. That's a rock and roll moment, surely. I take a hit. I hand him the pipe. I look up. I blow it out and I look in the back of the place and me and Tom and Vinnie Paul are on the jumbotron and Tom is full on like, <sighs> I'm exhaling. I, I'm like seeing my smoke, like going to Vinnie Paul's fan on the jumbotron. And I like elbow Tom and like point at it. And then like him and, it's me and him <laughs> laughing that Dude. we're smoking weed on the jumbotron. Okay. Now we're high. Enjoy a little bit more Pantera. Tom's like, all right, yo, good looking. I'm going to go back. I'm like, all right, cool. And he looks around, and there's a giant floor fan, like, just blowing on Vinnie Paul. Oh, and shit. Tom, it's summer. Everyone's got a bottle of water. Tom just fucking pours out his water into Vinnie Paul's fan, which just typhoons Vinnie Paul with, like, a fucking cloud of water. And then runs the other way. So Vinnie Paul's like, and gets blasted with water and looks. And I'm the only one standing there with a bottle of water. Oh and my God. Tom ran that way. <laughs> and I was like, I, 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 I. needless to say, I left. I uh, exit, <laughs> exit stage right. Oh my uh, God. That was Just, the best. Dude. Dude. So now when I'm lost in my world of metal, unbeknownst to me, Pharrell and Chad are blowing up. I run into Pharrell in like 2000 in the parking lot of Fred Siegel's in, in California, in LA. I'm walking out. Heavy Metal Scott loves to eat at Moro's at Fred Siegel. We go there for lunch all the time. I'm right. walking the parking lot. Somebody yells my name. I look over there and it's like a uh, young black man wearing sunglasses, a trucker hat, and a lot of jewelry. As you would imagine it, yeah. Don't really, don't recognize him. Last time I saw Pharrell, he was wearing cut off jean shorts and like a skateboard tee sitting in the office and he was robbing Rob's weird friend from Virginia. Yeah. I don't know this person with all the jewelry and the cool D glasses. 
He comes up. We have a real superficial conversation. I don't introduce him to Scott because I don't know who it is. Uh-huh. He, he, Pharrell mentioned somebody else from Def Jam, not Rob, but like, he's like, I just saw so-and-so from Def Jam. Or like it's bugged out. It's bugged out. I just ran into so and so. Yeah. It was somebody else who worked at Def Jam. Right. And and then he leaves. And Scott's like, "Who was that?" I was like, "Yo, I have no idea. A rapper from some rapper from Def Jam or something. I don't know." Yeah. I get back to New York about two weeks after that, and I run into Rob Walker, who I haven't seen in four years or something. Right. And he goes, "Oh, Pharrell said he saw you in LA." It's like I didn't see Pharrell. He said he saw you. He said he saw you in Fred's Eagle. I was like, "Oh shit!" I did see Pharrell in L.A. Me and Rob reconnect, um, and at the time, my man Loic was Kalisa's tour manager. Loic wow. Loic was somebody who worked at How Can I Be Down. We all came out of the Def Jam offices, right? Loic had, so he was a tour manager before he was. Part he of had the- been like nice and smooth tour manager back in the day. Like Loic's been. Well, he's French, but he's been in New York for a long time, and he's been part of like New York and hip hop and everything. He was down with Nice and Smooth and some other old school cats. But basically, when everybody, when when Mercury took over, when Polygram took over Def Jam, all these little companies had to like go off in different directions, get their own spaces, and like you know, people lost their jobs and companies broke up or whatever. So, like, like kind of got down with Rob and, and Pharrell and them and ended up touring, being Khalees' tour manager because he had some mm. experience. And, and Khalees, Khalees came out and got like, I think Khalees was opening for U2 in you Europe. Too? Yeah. I think Khalees was opening for, for, for U2 in Europe and Loic and Terrence were on, the, Loic and Pusher were on the road with her because Pusher had a song with her. Yeah. So, so, so was, this, was this like a, was there an, a, a connected like DNA of like Khalees, uh clips and uh, and Neptunes? Was that was that kind of was that was that was there a structure there to begin with? You know, I'm not really sure. Um, you know, Khalees is from Harlem, and Rob's from Harlem. I don't know how Khalees and, and the Neptunes originally connected. Right. She was, our, she was part of them when I got down. Gotcha. So. Like again, I wasn't paying any attention to hip hop in general or Pharrell. I was yeah. lost in a world of metal. Yeah, yeah. I was off, like you know, touring and you know, wiling out. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I ran into Rob. I ran into Pharrell. Then I ran into Rob. And then right around that time was when Rob and Pharrell and them got the Star Trek deal with Arista. So Loic called me and said, can you finish this tour with Khalees? Loic knew I was touring. Right. So he called me and said, I'm going to go and work at Star Trek. Can you finish this Khalees tour? I had just finished whatever tour I was on. And I was like, yeah, I need work. Yeah. So I went, on, I went from heavy metal to touring with Khalees, which was a bit of a culture clash. Yeah, it was a complete switch of roles, isn't it? Khalees, Khalees and I had our, our differences. Right. Um, but also had a great time. And, I, you know, I, it was like, you know, I was learning the shit too. You know what I mean? We were all young and learning, figuring out shit. Yeah. Um, and the, But then right after that, it was um, Sisters of Soul and Hip Hop Tour with India Irie, Mystic, Jazzy Joyce, and Khalees. Nice. Um, and then right after that was when NERD started. So NERD, it's funny, I didn't even know what it was really. But they were like, you know, NERD's got shows after that. Can you do those shows? And I was like, yeah. The first NERD show, that NERD did like two shows in Boston with Chad DJ. Yeah? Then, yeah. Early, early. Yeah. early. Yeah. The first two or three shows were like Chad DJ and just like weirdo like performances. Um, and then the first real show they got was at RFK Stadium, which is where the Washington Redskins play in DC. It's like sixty thousand people stadium for Damn. some for some radio show. Yeah. Like, 
on BLS Summer Show. They weren't the only people. There were there were other bands, or oh, was it just... a show, yeah. And they were just yeah. like, and that was the first show we ever did. That's the first time I ever did, worked with them. I, I didn't know who Lee Harvey was. Hmm. I didn't know anybody. I had met Pharrell like you know a few times, and I didn't know Shay. I didn't know Chad. I mean, I knew yeah. Chad. Chad wasn't. I don't even think Chad was there. But anyway, and then I became a tour manager. And I was like, you know, I did all the NERD shit, all the clone shows, all the um, the Pharrell solo album tours until we started Billionaire Boys Club. Um, and I just, I at that time, I just decided I I didn't want to tour anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd been like living out of a suitcase for mad long and was just like sick of traveling all the time. Mm-hmm. So I saw the clothing opportunity. And I was like, yo, I want to kind of switch, switch lanes. And um, it was, it was, again, it was organic. It was like, we weren't touring. Like Pharrell would come off the road, go yeah. in the studio and I wouldn't have a job. You know? Yeah. That's the, that's the, that's the thing with album releases, isn't it? You know, this seasonal. Well, unless, like, you know, it's like the same with the fucking book. I wasn't really trying to be a tour manager. I wanted to be in the industry. I wanted to be involved with artists, but it wasn't like, I just started touring out of necessity because I didn't want to move to LA and I wanted to travel the world. I wanted to, like, actually mm. see some shit. Yeah. Um, I really wanted to go to Europe. Um, I had never really been. Um, you did, bro. You did. And that's where we, uh, well, this is where you and me. Well, how about... Why don't you tell them how you how you met me? Nobody knows. I mean, well, a few I, people. I'll tell you exactly what happened. <laughs> right? I was under some notion. 2002, I did a beatbox cover of Britney Spears' Slave for You. Beatboxed to MTV over in Europe. And the guy that filmed me doing it, it was after a show. MTV were just covering me. And they said to me, oh, we're seeing Pharrell and NERD next week. I had a vague idea of who Pharrell was because of Neptune's, but I didn't know no NERD. <coughs> I barely knew any of their songs. But did you I know Pharrell th- produced the Britney Spears song? Yeah, yeah, he did the slave. I th- well, I'm, I'm <coughs> right. the, uh, you, you knew with the Neptune song. Yeah, yeah, I knew who the I knew who the Neptunes were, <coughs> and that was that was my thing. When he said to me, "Oh, you know Pharrell from the Neptunes," I'm like, "What? Yeah, wicked, cool. Well, yeah, send it to them, you know, like that." Anyway, I, you know, I get back home, you know, 2002 or something, and I, I start really, like, procrastinating with this thing in my head, thinking to myself, well, like, I've got, to, I've, got to, I've got to do something. I've got to try and connect with them and stuff like that, you know? And because, because I want them to be knowing me as the guy that did the beatbox thing on this, on this show. And uh, for all I know, the guy may not have even sent it to them, but I was on this blind faith that he did. and. Then out of nowhere, I see that Pharrell's playing uh, a gig with Khalees. So I go to the gig and then check it out. And I'm like, yeah, there's the guy, there's the guy. Then this NERD thing plays out. And I know Khalees' DJ, Nikki Beatnik. And I'm like, yo, like, any idea playing? Is Khalees going to be there? Is there any way you can connect me? And she's like, no, but they're playing my after, they're coming to my after party. They're coming to an after party which is the show before they do their thing. And I'm like, all right, cool. And that's where you and me meet. That's how that thing connects. Then after that, I think, because you and me, you know, on introduction were super cool. And you are like, yo, you should come down to the sound check. Come down to their sound check tomorrow down at London, London Astoria. Astoria, yeah. Yeah. So I go a step beyond that. I don't remember the thing we, we met at. Yeah, it was like an, it was underground club. It was somewhere in Soho in in london it was somewhere in it was one of those kind of bougie places both you and me looked a little out of place i must admit <laughs> yeah, i'm sure we did <laughs> but but this is the kicker right my so style, my style was wild back then yeah bro like we we you know i don't know how you my your impressions of me came across i was definitely green wet and very 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 hungry tiger but um yeah you look like a skater dude you look you look like a skater dude that was tour managing these guys do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, that, it, 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 it had a cool, cool kitch to it. And for the, for the venue, that is. And uh, yeah, so check this out. I get to London Astoria at about three o'clock in the afternoon because I ain't missing a thing. And I bring my sound engineer. Now, my sound engineer knows all the engineers in London. So if anyone was going to walk in 
uh, unannounced and act like he owned the place, he mm -hmm. could get away with it. Mm -hmm. So I hid in the booth of the uh, of this um, the sound booth mm -hmm. for approximately three hours, while mm -hmm. my sound guy walks around and casually sets up a channel. Like none of the NERD guys know this. Like he set up a whole strip with my EQs and everything. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember tail end of the sound check because none of you guys came through, but I saw you passing through. I don't know whether we conversated before, but Pharrell and the guys declined doing the sound check. They were just in the backstage area. So they were walking through and I remember like, seeing you and the guys at the corner of my eye and Loic was there as well and Rob and I run to the I run round the back because I know the, the venue and and I'm like yo little guys you can't leave I've got to show you something God fucking I'm that guy I'm the guy from 2002 the, you know what I mean <laughs> and you're I think you you and uh you and Rob kind of coax the whole situation and steer everyone I'm literally like like yapping dog dragging everyone to the middle of the stage floor where my sound engineer has the mic ready. And I just remember like this kind of uh, Jedi moment where the lightsman, you know, I'm grateful for him, just plonks two spotlights on me <laughs> and Pharrell. <laughs> and, and I just hurl vernacular of like nothing but like Neptune's rhythms and beats and shit. <laughs> and... Uh, and yeah, a, a trail of fire was set. I was getting phone calls from you pretty much most days saying, yo, ke yo, Keller, you know, Pharrell's down at the BBC. He wants you to come through, give us a shout. It was, mm -hmm. almost, it was almost like I was having this imposter syndrome. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, yo, what have I done? What the fuck? And the next thing, it's like, it just continues. Next thing I'm on stage with... Justin and Pharrell and like you're, you're yeah like didn't did, didn't Pharrell bring you out that night at the Astoria yeah twice <laughs> yeah <laughs> she was crazy yeah crazy it, there must be a video of that somewhere do you I have that there to be no I don't have it there was there was a bunch of occasions there was the Coronet there was the London Astoria then there was the Sprite Liquid Mix tour there was a German show there was an Ireland show. Mm -hmm. Like so, I mean, I, you know what I mean? Like crazy seminal moments in my career. You know, I, uh, I allowed my, I allowed myself to be accessible. Hmm. Uh, and, and one of the things I enjoyed about touring was like, something that would be really easy for me to do would be like a fantasy come true for somebody. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm not talking about like with you, like that's like some artist, artist something, but like I would like often like go out in the crowd or like go out outside of a show and like grab some kids who didn't have tickets Same. and give them passes and introduce them to the band or whatever. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, it was just like, it was gratifying to me. And like it was so amazing to like blow fucking people's minds. Mm, mm. You know? Like they just came down to the show, they didn't have a ticket, but they just wanted to like hang out or whatever. And then all of a sudden they're like sitting on a couch backstage, like drinking with Pharrell or something, or you know, Pharrell doesn't drink, but you know what I mean, like hanging around. Yeah. Like, behind the scenes, you know, like one time on on the Sprite tour, what we would have to do is like after after a band would get off stage, they would have to go and do a radio interview. And so it was like a cycle, like, you know, the band before us would go. And then when we got there, they would be finishing their interview and the next person would go. Yeah. And one day there was, I think it was maybe 311. I can't remember what, what band it was, but it was like one of those like 311 or OAR. I can't remember. Just like one of those bands that was mm -hmm. on two of us. Um, while we were waiting to go and they were finishing up, I saw this kid like outside the fence, like peeking through the fence, like looking like he was going to pee his pants. And I went up to him. I was like, yo, you good? And he was like, yeah. He's like, I just love them. He's like, That's my favorite band. They're like, I'm so close. He's like, I can't believe I'm so close to them. I was like, yo, come here. I, I took him. I brought him over to where we were. He didn't really give a shit about Pharrell. 
but he was like, you know, he was cool. He was like, wow, nice to meet you guys. Mm-hmm. And then those dudes got up from this table. We walked up to the table and I was like, I was like, hold up. I was like, yo, guys, I, was like, I want you to meet, you know, whatever his name was. Jim, I want you to meet Jimmy. He's like your biggest fan. And they're like, no way. What's up, Jimmy? And then just took him and just took him off with, with them. And then like an hour and a half later, I saw Jimmy with them, like hanging out in their trailer or something. And like we had this moment, like from like twenty feet away, where he was just like, I can't believe I'm in this trailer. you know. <laughs> and it's like, it, it, like it took no effort on my part. Uh, yeah, but I, 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 but I think changed that kid's life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's like the best thing that ever happens to him, dude. Look. What you did for I me, I think that. I've thanked you like a trillion times over the years. But so, so you know, that being said, I always, always wondered because obviously those are clear incentives, and and you know that's what that's what makes you like one of the realists. You know what I mean? But the, the thing that interests me is like, how far does your willingness and uh, generosity go and how does that fare up to someone like for instance Pharrell now I I know him as an acquaintance enough to know that he's cool with not having a security guard he's pretty chilled about people being around him that he may or may not know or at least he was back then but like do, do you think his do you think your generosity is transferred in bands like that do, 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 do you ever get like those kind of moments of like door lock like no 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 you can't you can't just see. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you gotta. I mean, there's times where you gotta, you know, put the gauntlet down and not be that that generous or whatever. But, mm. but honestly, I say this all the time when I when I talk to people about my experience. It's like I couldn't have worked. I I, I couldn't have worked for a cooler person. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't know. Like on. Like honestly, I don't think I could work for somebody who wasn't cool. Yeah, like, I get you. Like. I see how other artists act, whether it's how they treat their tour managers or how they just t- treat their fans or how they treat just people who work for and around yeah. them. And Pharrell's, you know, one of the nicest people and like most humble. And even when he doesn't want to, is still generous with his time and gracious and and yeah. and, 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 and and ultra respectful of everybody. The thousand person, percent, bro. The, thousand the, percent. The, the 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 janitor who brings the towels, whoever gets is is Mister and Sir and Ma'am and thank you and appreciate it. Mm-hmm. You know, of course, I'll take a picture. And you know, I mean, for all I miss flights because we were taking pictures. Mm-hmm. It fucked mm-hmm. my day up. You know, but that's the type of duty, and I, and I say it all the time. I'm so lucky. Yeah, I don't think I'm like. You, you know who John Giddings is? No. Yes, you do. John Giddings is the the legend uh, booking agent from London. He had solo agency. He books the Stones and yes, you, I do. I met him. I met him with you. Yeah. I met him at um, uh, Wireless Festival. Yes. Yeah. John Giddings is the the classiest. Yeah, he's a nice. Dude. He's awesome. And and, and, and he, you introduced me with Pharrell. I remember. He's he's my hero. He's one of my mm-hmm. heroes. Um, John Giddings called me the David Bowie of tour managers. I don't yeah. know what exactly that means, but yeah. I like it, and I feel like I'm not like your stereotypical tour manager. And it's funny because I don't think like I could tour manage right now. Like I feel like you know when we when I was doing it, I was making it up as I went along. I was you know I didn't. I don't think I did a great job in terms of like having books for everybody and everybody knowing what was going on, or whatever, sharing information. And like, you know, I feel like sometimes like, you know, the, the management office would not know exactly where we were or what we were doing, you know, yeah. and we'd go off the map sometimes and it'd be a little bit like hunt for red October and I'd be Sean Connery and you wouldn't know if I was, <laughs> I was defecting or not, you know, yeah. if, if everybody was still, still on, on the bus. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. You know, I got the job done, and like you know, you know, Rob was young, Loic was young, Pharrell was young, you know, and we were all just sort of like 
doing what made sense. And, you know, like we were talking about earlier, using this common sense from mm -hmm. our experiences or whatever. I must admit that, like, that period of that, that touring, I remember the, from the first day we connected and, you know, three years, arguably three years of on and off throughout, you know, seasonal with whenever NERD were close to town or I was in their neck of the woods. Um, I definitely saw a, a change in the clientele. It was like one minute it was pretty skateboardy, you know, um, and, and, and more uh, outcasty of an audience and not so um, a bit bohemian. The backstage was a little bit more sparse but by the yeah. time it got to like, I don't know, maybe best part of 2008. Yeah. Probably like the last tale ends of like some of the moments. I'd, I'd, I think the last time I connected with Pharrell was in New Zealand or something. Um, the, the crowds were insane. The, the backstage was quite glitzy and new. And like there was, there was a lot of people that were there. Cool, all cool. Like nothing, you know, nothing odd about that. Well, but it was just like up. trajectory wise, it was crazy to see. Yeah. It is crazy to see, and like you know, like I don't, th you know, again, those were like salad days. That like it was just a moment in time where it's like you know I couldn't like take Pharrell and Shay and my man's fucked up Honda Civic to sound check mm -hmm. anymore. Like that, that 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 doesn't happen anymore. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, we used to just, it was like, you know, whatever. It's like, it's just some bug out, like, young shit. Like, you know, you look back now, it's like, I can't believe. You Best know, shit of your life, man. Like, some, some of the most fun Absolutely. stuff happens yeah. like that. Salad days. Yeah. Um, but that's my, that's sort of like the pedigree. Yeah. That's where, that's, that's where I've been. And that, that kind of, it's, it is almost like an ode, a salute. It's, it's a okay sign. That when you're rolling like that and you're, you know, you're, um, you honor yourself and you, you represent yourself right. It's got to, it's got to be a good feeling to know that you, you went through that part of your life and it was just, you know, th these were super informative times of your, your career and your, your, you know, your life, and, right? And, and to, to, you know, just to know people like I, like I know you, like we can sit here and talk about it and it's like, you know, just like you were figuring it out, like you somehow found a way to be at this, the after party thing, talk to me, show up to sound check, have the fucking, the, just the common sense and wherewithal and, you know, to bring your engineer to have the fucking lineup, mm. you know, and to have like, you know, your, your Intel. Yeah. Right. To, to you, you gotta that's, that's here's the lesson for the kids you gotta figure it out you yeah. gotta put yourself in the right places and you gotta you know say the right thing at the right time and shake the right hand and kiss the right baby and like you know Thousand be, percent. A, be a person like be of your word and like fucking stand out you know yeah you know, yeah totally stay, oh. you know take yeah. take a deep breath and jump off the cliff you yeah. know what I mean? And, What's the worst that could happen? Huh? <laughs> well, you, you, you can't, you can't hit the target if you don't take the shot. Yeah. And sometimes it's you know nerve wracking or confusing or whatever. You're not sure what to do. Mm. And then all of a sudden you did it, and you're like, "What the fuck have I done?" Pharrell just called me, and we're I'm getting on stage with Justin Timberlake. Yeah. Or whatever, <laughs> you know. Did you see my face when you said that shit to me, though? <laughs> the total. <No. laughs> I remember. I remember. I know where it was with the Brixton Academy, and I do distinctly remember me having to go to the toilet and just talk to myself very calmly. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. there was just so much going on. It was just so much, and for like, like I said, twenty-four year old me, I'm just like, it was just. Uh, the crazy. first time, I went, the first time I went to Japan. We got off the plane and, and the promoter rep and a couple other people that were like the Japanese side of things started started talking, like, you know, talking to me because I'm the tour manager. 
and they were referring to me in the third person as Mr. Phillips, saying Mr. Philip. But I didn't understand that they were saying Mr. Philip. And so they'd be like, you know, if it's okay with Mr. Phillips. And I'd be like, okay, well, let me know what he says. <laughs> and we were having this whole like miscommunication for like the first 18 hours that I was there. <laughs> where I, and, and they were getting annoyed because I wasn't answering any question. Yeah. Because they kept asking, like it wasn't, they weren't asking me. <laughs> they were like, neither questions for Mr. Phillips. Here's the question, Mr. Phillips. Like, <laughs> You're like, okay. And then all of a sudden I was like, I'm Mr. Phillips. <laughs> You, you can't see, so you can't see, see, and look, you can't buy that. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, world traveling and common sense and the things that are really contributive to a, a, a good mindset, mental health wise, and just all the things that are going on in the world at the moment, that, my friend, this, this whole conversation epitomizes that. Mm-hmm. Crazy. You know, I crazy, got- bro. When I was doing that touring, I, I, I got myself a, a blank T-shirt and I got iron-on letters and I put on the back of them, stupid American. <laughs> and that was my like European work outfit because I was always the one who had to go and ask the stupid question to like people who didn't speak English or whatever. And I, yeah. would that, like, I would, as I was walking away from asking my stupid question, the people were saying stupid American. <laughs> I on the back of my shirt and was like, yes, I, I saved them. <laughs> I know. I'm asking the stupid question. I'm sorry. Where is the bathroom? Yeah. 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 And so you get a really straight edged like, answer as well. With people with right there, but I'm just going to ask you one time where's, where's the bathroom? Yeah. 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 Tell me, how do you, you know, and, and this was like a, a, another <clears throat> moment in your career, but how, how did, how did the transition between you going from tour managing NERD? Um, etc and then being like one of the main kind of operators of billionaires boys club in new york um you know just on some figuring it out shit it's like we went to japan pharrell and nigo became friends and pharrell told nigo what about his clothing idea Hmm. and you know very quickly nigo had um, Skate Thing, who is the, the graphic designer who did all the original Babe stuff, hmm. um, do the Billionaire Boys Club and ice cream logos. And we came back from that trip and the wheels were set in motion. Um, and very quickly we had a line designed and samples made. Um, and again, it was like, you know, one of those times where Pharrell wasn't touring, so I didn't have anything to do. Um, they got a showroom to sell the samples to maybe I think 14 stores or something in America. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause it was super uh, limited. you like, you only had like two stores in England. I think the first, you know, I'm not sure. Oh yeah. We, we were at uh what is it? Foot patrol or whatever. I can't remember what the name of the store was, but anyway, we placed an order. We, we took wholesale orders for 10 stores and a couple of stores around the world. And then we ordered a certain amount for our web store that we were designing. And then we made a website, put the clothes on it. The clothes were on their way from Japan. They showed up in New York. We didn't have a store or an office or anything. So Loic's mom had an antique store in Soho that we shipped the boxes to the basement. But all of a sudden there was, you know, 150 boxes of clothing from Japan that needed to be broken out, shipped to the 14 stores. And then when when we turned on the the website, we got like a thousand orders immediately. And it was like, we didn't even have a UPS account. Shit. We didn't even have boxes to this ship. This is insane. Shit. This is street culture upon street culture of like Intel knowledge. So yeah, I'm, my Loic, head's blown. Carry on. <laughs> Loic and I, for the most part, with a little help from a couple friends and Rob Walker would make an appearance here and there, broke down the 150 boxes into the store orders and shipped those out. 
got a UPS account and ordered some boxes and started shipping, you know, literally packing orders. So no, as soon as it landed, you're packing them back in other boxes. Yeah, just small packages. Like you order, you order a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. Yeah, yeah. I get the fucking jeans and t-shirt and put it in a box and mail it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Rihanna one time said to me, "I know you. You're the name on all the packages I get." Because my name was on the return address. It would say Philip Lee Billionaire Boys Club on the UPS. Yeah. Um, so whatever it was just like you know jobs needed things needed to get done yeah we did them Loic and I fucking Loic and I can do anything we fucking go to space if we had to uh-huh, uh-huh, um, uh-huh. and so you know we, we fought our way through those thousand orders and set up a, a you know kind of like a warehouse situation then within like the first or second season we we stopped working with the showroom and we started our own showroom and then clothes had to get sold. So I, I started doing all the wholesale stuff for all the American accounts and I ran all the e-commerce shit. I ran the website literally from taking the pictures of the clothes, editing them, putting them on the website and then in the morning printing out the orders and packing the fucking boxes. Hmm. Me and my dog rough. <laughs> Ruffy work at BBC. Um, and so, you know, Loic dealt with all the international stuff, the, the, the design and, and international um, licensing and whatever. And I dealt with all the American wholesale stuff, all the PR stuff in America, all yeah. the e-commerce stuff. Um, and then they start. I had, you know, I had to get in the lookbooks because we needed to shoot lookbooks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we got Ebro and Vashti and me and D and Ricky and all the all of our friends to just be in the lookbook. But there must have been like a real, and I mean, there there was a real end. There was a real energy to it. It felt like a real a bespoke approach to like. There must have been a lot of people that would have taken up the opportunity to do a lookbook or do. Something with the attachment of you know NERD Pharrell um, and what you guys had established in terms of product. You know what I mean. One of the things that was really important to Pharrell is that the clothing company be standalone and not rely on him. Right. We didn't often put like you know for a while like we didn't put Pharrell in the lookbooks until later and um he you know. It's he, he. It's almost like the same way I was about my book. It's like he's like a little bit weird about it. Like he didn't want to stand too close to it, maybe, mm-hmm, or like mm-hmm. he didn't want it to like be be solely dependent on on him. He wanted it to be like you know like Levi's or something. It's like it's not about people aren't buying Levi's because of Levi Strauss. Yeah, I get you. Yeah, Levi is. Yeah, um, they're buying it because you know they're dope jeans and they're they last or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Mine is fresh, and so um, it was super high end, and you know it was it was expensive because we were making such small amounts of stuff in Japan and mm. using the you know Japanese manufacturing is like the best on earth, and yeah, you know yeah. when you make fifty of something or you only make twenty of something, the shit is mad expensive. People thought we were bugging because we had eighty dollars t shirts. It's like the shit literally cost us like seventy six dollars by the time they got here. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the th- people don't realize that, especially yeah. at that time, you know. People thought Pharrell was bugging, but like literally, we weren't making that much money in the beginning. You know, it was really mm. expensive and it was precarious as, as a business. Mm. Um, but we figured it out, and it's doing. It's, you know, it's crazy. It's still doing really well. It only goes up in price. That's the impression I get. You know, we. It's it's gone up and down. I haven't like you know really been involved in five or six years, so I'm not up on like where their prices are now. We we had like we had some tough times, and the brand was like sort of diluted for a little while. I think they've done a really good job of like bringing back the brands to their original integrity, but yeah, for a yeah. while they, they, they were there was there was some fuckery going on for sure. Um. This is this is a quite a broad question, and I don't 
I don't think there's a real answer because if there was, it would be bottled and sold. But when you've got like, when you've got synergy like that, like where does somebody get that energy as a character to rally up such a strong team like you, Loic, Rob, the, the, the production value of, of a Neptune's beat being so on point and they turn these things around like cookie cutter to then have a band that tours the world to then have a clothing range to then have setups all over the shop and just opportunities just like synergy like heading it's a really one. special person like for real for, you know the, the, taking chat out of the neptune thing for a minute it's like it's pharrell mm. the neptune wouldn't be the neptune without chad like chad is integral but but pharrell on his own is a powerhouse and like you know just such i don't know if it's the zodiac sign or what they put in the water where he grew up but he's got this energy and this imagination it's like a, it's like imagination is is crucial in the creative process and it's like mm. you know bbc ice cream started because pharrell wanted like he had this idea of like um like pajama wear almost like he wanted to wear like comfy cool like quirky clothes like you know my man loves spongebob um, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know it's like <laughs> uh -huh. You know, he wanted, you know, it's like BBC was like some outer space aspirational shit and ice cream was like skater, skater breakfast cereal or something. Yeah. And it became such a thing. It, that just well, you know, what's interesting is like everybody, it's like, it was like Bape. Nobody could get Bape. Hmm. Everyone kind of like, like, you know, like Stash and Futura and the BC boys connected with Nigo and exposed the masses a little bit to Babe. Yeah. It was like, yeah. what's that camo that the BC boys are wearing? Yeah. You know, it's like, I don't know what that is, but I want it. Yeah, for and sure. And you'd see it here and there, and you'd see that Ape logo, and you'd be like, it was just some shit you couldn't get. And, yeah. and, and the BC boys started XL. That's right. Right. Which was kind of like Bape inspired. It was like Bape and Sir and everybody was kind of all on some like um Planet of the Apes influence. And it was right? like a DIY punk um attitude to like a a, a, a brand you know what I mean it yeah, yeah. took a lot of cues from it like you say in Bape, oh, you know. Yeah. Um and then and then Pharrell really is like the next Bape wave. Mm. When we went and linked up with Nigo and, and and Pharrell just started wearing nothing but Bape, that's what really caused Bape to explode. Mm. And then we dropped. I mean, Wayne Wayne definitely like pushed Bape a little bit. Um, the clips definitely pushed it a little bit, but but basically, um, you know, Pharrell has a Midas touch to things. Mm. Real trucker hat's cool. You know, Pharrell got everybody wearing fedoras. Yeah. You know, Pharrell, Pharrell got, Pharrell drastically affected black men and skinny jeans. Yeah. Yeah. And like, yo, before that, everybody's shit was mad baggy on the bottom. Yeah, yeah, for real. Um, I had, uh, I had Joe Corey, uh, Vivian Westwood's son on the podcast. And I, I you know, I talked to him about, the, the Pharrell hat thing, you know, with the, the big hat that was Westwood's. Um, and he was saying it was, you know, it was it, obviously it was his parents' thing, but, but he also has um, a child of the Jago, which has the same manufacturers as Vivian Westwood's uh, company does for the hats. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was saying, like, that was lock off because it was an all British made hat company. Right. So, like, literally, as soon as Pharrell wore it, it was like, you just weren't getting a new stock. Right. Yo, it's crazy. Like, so many things that Pharrell does and touches turn out to be new staples. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's like you can't bottle that. You can't. 
I don't think you can learn it. You know, you can try. And I feel like, you know, it's like, um, what's, what's Q-Tip say? The way that Bobby Brown is just amping like Michael. It's yeah. like, Michael, like without Mike, without James Brown, there'd be no anybody. And then yeah. without James Brown, there'd be no Michael Jackson. Without Michael yeah. Jackson, there'd be no Bobby Brown. Without, you know, and so, like, from the Pharrell, from Pharrell, there's going to be, you know, Pharrell, Pharrell passed the power to Kanye. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, and from Kanye and from Pharrell, there's going to, you know, there's Tyler. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's like. Matt. It keeps continuing. And it's like, without, without the past, there's no future or whatever. It's like, um, there'll be other Midas touches and influential people but like you know Pharrell's one of those people that's like gonna be looked at like Quincy or you know yeah. the icons before him and Pharrell's yeah. really you know, I'm not taking it with I'm not saying that other people are I mean Kanye is super influential in fashion and all kind of other areas um politics but Pharrell Pharrell doesn't involve politics with things and he doesn't he doesn't attack it, it, for what Pharrell does comes naturally. It feels it's like it's just a positive, you know what I mean? And like, yeah. there's, there's never any drama. There's never any beef. You're like nobody's got beef with Pharrell. You know, it's nobody's... a crazy notion. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's like, you know, there's, once in a while, like there's been like some, some, like someone like, you know, talking a little sideways because they, you know, think his pants are a little tight or whatever. But, you know, for the most part, everybody loves Pharrell and, you know, it's just the way he carries himself or whatever. And yeah, he kind of, he kind of became an okay sign at the time, at a time where there was like a real, there no, was a, there was a window of opportunity where I think cultures were coming together a lot more. I think internet played a big part in it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, like, like skateboard, like black, black kids and skateboards. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. Backpacks and shit. Backpackers. Yeah. Yeah. Like Pharrell, Pharrell kind of blended urban and the suburban, the hood and like the the hoodness of the suburbs or whatever. Yeah, dude. You know, you know, like just I feel like Pharrell made it okay to be a black kid and not be a cookie cutter hip hopper or whatever. You know, he yeah. made it okay to be you know dye your hair colors and you know, wear tight pants and skateboard or, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for real. For real. But he still hung with the, the, those kind of characters. Like Clips was definitely from, from the street and did it their own way. And then you'd see the collaborations that they did with Neptunes and that, it painted a picture of them that was very different. So in a way, they kind of, they, they made, they pushed themselves, at, they pushed a presence like that into the scene. You know what I mean? It's not like, Buster Rhymes was going to go wearing tight jeans. Like, they, yeah, yeah. they enforced that. You know what I mean? Well, you know, Pharrell walks comfortably in all kinds of circles. Yeah. You know, it, you know, and, and, and I mean, I guess that's sort of like kind of like the reason we get along. Like, Pharrell, like, I do it too. It's like other tour managers would like not do half the shit I do. Yeah, that's it. I'll walk out on stage and say, whisper something in Pharrell's ear in the middle of his fucking show. You know, or like, you know, I'll, I'm cool with Justin and Cameron Diaz and whoever's in the studio and whatever. Like, yo, I'm not, I'm yeah. not uncomfortable. I'm not like talking up to you and you guys aren't talking down to me. Yeah. You know? yeah. Like, you know, just because I'm not the one who's famous doesn't mean I'm not important here. Yeah, yeah, no. But, but and, he also commands those sorts of people. You know, like you say, he, there's a reason why there's a chemistry between you and other people and and those things that you do that may not be seen as appropriate from a tour management or a or or a label exec is is actually or a clothing brand you know manager it's it, you you command that you command that what it is, you know what I mean? it's like it's like that thing we were talking about earlier of like you know having exposure to different stuff it's like yeah. you know whether it's Pharrell growing up in the suburbs and the hood and having that kind of ability to, there's a, there's a word for it. It's like, um, 
it's like when you put on your like professional voice or whatever, I can't think of the term for it, but you know, have an ability to like adapt and speak the, the, the language being spoken. Climatizing but, almost like put, putting yourself. Yeah. Like, know you, like you know, you know, just from me growing up in New York city and getting into the shit I was into or Pharrell, you know, like, you know, I can talk to gangsters or I could talk to executives mm. and speak to them in a language that we can communicate in. And that, you know, I'm comfortable around that, you know, like one time <laughs> we were in Houston and like, you know, just being, a, just being me or whatever, being like a neurotic tour manager, I like kind of like walked into a room and kind of like yelled at Pharrell a little bit. And in the room was like Slim Thug and Bun B and Pusher and, some other human rapper yeah. and I kind of like walked in like I had already told Pharrell that like it was about the time to go on like to put his microphone on or something and I walked back in and he hadn't done shit and I was like kind of snapped on him and I was like yo what the fuck you know blah 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 and like kind of like hurried him out of the room or something and then Terrence came up to me and he was like yo you can't yell at Pharrell like that in front of everybody and I was like I yelled at him He's like, yeah, he came in and like snapped on him for not giving me money. I was like, oh, oh shit. I didn't even think of, like, it didn't even occur to me. Yeah. And I went up to Pharrell and I was like, yo, man, I didn't mean to like flip on you in front of the people or whatever. He, and like, Pharrell didn't even know what I was talking about. And like, that's, wow. like, he, it's like, whatever. We had, we had, we had a working relationship that was really great. And I don't feel like I could get that, that easily was you know just if i went out and tried to be a tour manager right now or like you know like push asked me to do shows with him a few years back like after i left bbc mm. he had shows and he didn't have a tour manager for it. he just had like some one-off shows or whatever and i went and did one and it was so annoying to me. <laughs> I was like, i'm not doing the rest um just like dealing with like other people and management and like yeah yeah you know just it, you know, it takes a lot. Tour managing is stressful. And like, if you don't have all the info, it's a real drag. Yeah, of course. You're, and cause and, you, it's a thankless yeah, task like, as well. You know, <laughs> like I could, I could definitely, like I could not do it for Pharrell. He's like, so he's a, Pharrell's, Pharrell's evolved so much, you know, he's like a fucking top tier artist. You know, he's like the, the upper echelon of, of artists, you know, and it's like, yeah, yeah he's got real professionals doing real professional shit. And I don't, I'm not on that level. You know, so I smoke weed. Hmm. The dressing room smells like weed, but the show, the show will go on. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. Yeah. He, uh, he's, he's made a huge, huge jump into stratospheric levels. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's it, and do you know, you're, will forgiven for you know being not not making the grade because it's just it's it's so seismic it's um it's beyond equation do you know what i mean it's it's amazing and uh well deserved he works really hard and he's fucking yeah. genius. for bless real his, bless his little heart say again i said bless his little heart bro without question i don't there's very, 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 very few people I can even like. I can't even. He who deserves it more? Do you know what I mean he he totally deserves deserves it? Do you know what it, I mean? It's really bugged out though. It's like my whole shit, my whole career, from from my internship. I met him at my internship when he was an intern. He was Teddy Riley's intern. Yeah, th these th hey these stories. Yeah, yeah. And and everything. I owe everything to, to, to that life from, I mean, you know, I made my own way and like, you know, made it up to a certain point before I ended up actually working for him. Mm -hmm. But you know, my, my fame, all my Polaroids, like most of those are shot, like, you know, at the BBC showroom because people were coming to BBC to mm -hmm. get clothes. Yeah. You know, and whatever it's, um, I'm really lucky and, um, you, it's like, it's some shit you can't plan for Hmm. You know, you just, I, I've just been like going down the river. Yeah. yeah. 
you know, and like one thing has led to the next, like from Fran to Peter to Scott to Pharrell. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask you something? Um, oh, while we're here, <laughs> um, do you know when you when you come off a ride like that, quote unquote ride? Do, is there like a? Is there any sort of like? And he said, it sounds melodramatic, all right, but is there like a a mild form of PTSD where you like you've you kind of uh, yeah. land back on the ground and you're like, fuck, what happened? Hell yes. Yeah. First of all, I used to get it with touring. When I would come off the road, I would like miss the tour bus, yeah. and like that, it's like a safe zone. It's like yeah, your yeah. little safe house. Yeah. Um, it was coming off the road was definitely a, a hard adjustment. Um, and what about when? What about when coming off the back of uh, BBC and ice cream and doing? I was just going to say, you know, I left. Yeah. Um, I left about five years ago, I think, and it's totally bugged out being on your own and not being part of like a winning team and mm-hmm. have your shot. Like I kind of like had some ideas about what I was going to do that, you know, didn't quite, not that it didn't work out, but they didn't quite go as I thought they would go. And, um, and when I left, I did the book. So when I left, I had the book project and like that consumed a lot of time and, and, Mm. and then had like a little, you know, a a little time of shining. Yeah, for sure. that and but but honestly that sort of distracted me from some other things I was do trying to do at the same time. Gotcha. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but you don't make any money off of books. It's like it's like a vanity project. Or something. No, but it does it does feel like a nice kind of closure. But like if you were to celebrate the, the, the rewards of like having a a, a a mini life of like all these, you you know you gathering pieces that is then celebrated at the end in the, in the book form. You know what I mean? A hundred percent. Great. It's a great, I mean, it's just great to like come out of all that with something. Yeah. For sure. I'm shooting. Like I have maybe, they stopped making the film. So I have maybe 20 or 30 photos left on that camera. There's right. some talk that they might come out with a new film for it. Um, but I have enough photos to do one more book. That's crazy. Um, and so I've been toying with that idea a little bit. Dope. Um, I, I want to be in it. <laughs> yeah, well, My you turn. know, I, it's funny because sometimes I think of people like you, like I was like, you know, just when the book came up when we first started talking, I was like, I kind of can't believe I don't have a Polaroid of you. Yeah. You know, but like, yo, listen, if I if I was really on it, if I knew what I was going to do with the Polaroid, I would have been oh, yeah. on it taking every fucking person who came through the door of BBC because like, yo, mad people were at BBC that I never even thought, like it just wouldn't even occur to me. I wouldn't take yeah, yeah. months and then I'd be like, oh, <sighs> oh, I forgot about this. And I'd get the camera out and like take pictures. Dude, you, you and me both, like the amount of people that come through the podcast and it was only like after like my 40th, 50th, someone said to me, hey, you know, you should get a photo with them while they're here. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Just shit like that. It's yeah, like, oh, shit. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Um, so yeah, pick up the book. Um, Hell yeah, pick next up the time book. You're in New York, let's Say again? shoot your Polaroid. Next time you're in New York, we got to shoot your Polaroid. Hell yeah. Well, I was going to plan. I was planning on coming. I mean, like you got my, you'd help hook me up my visa. I was ready to go. That's the cover. Which I also need to thank you for. Thank you for helping me out my visa as well. Smash I write a good letter. Yeah, you do. Killed it on a letter front. Yeah. Um, Anything you want to add, sir, to your podcast? Because it's been incredible. And I honestly, I've never been so mouth shut to mouth open inconsistently for, for, for such I'm a happy, long period of time. I'm happy to be here and share stories. Um, I appreciate you and your encouragement. Um, and don't believe the hype. <laughs> oh, OG ending. You know, I feel like there's a lot of fuckery going on in the world. The world's a real fucked up place and the future is uncertain. Yeah. So hug the people you love and fucking be safe and don't believe the hype. Don't believe We're the fucking for a lot hype. of bullshit these days. Phil, I love you, brother. Thank you so much. I'm so happy and 
proud to know you. You're, you're a total gentleman. You're a man of your world, the realist. I appreciate you thoroughly, brother. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast, bro. Thank you, bro. I love you too. All right. Love to the family, man. Ladies and gentlemen, Philip fucking Leeds, man. Big shout out to my guy. Philip Leeds is the place. If you want to check out the book, make sure you go online. Uh, You got it there? Just to show him one more time there, Phil. Big shots. You got it there. The big shots, all right? Make sure you can surf that one out. And uh, yeah, man. It's all in the legacy. There's one thing we're going to take away from this conversation is life is your journey. Make it happen, all right? Feel like a podcast. Outlet in was out of fashion. Stay lucky, people. See you next week. Peace.